Now, I know in my last film review, I just said that I would be first reviewing films that take place during the Sengoku Jidai before moving on to films that take place in a different period, but this one is special because it's a ghost story. And with Halloween just around the corner, I think it's a perfect choice for my next review. So without further ado, here is Koroneko. Kuruneko, which translates to The Black Cat, is a film that was released in 1968 and is the first movie I am reviewing that was not directed by Akira Kurosawa, but rather directed by Kaneto Shindo, the same director behind another Japanese horror classic, Onibaba. Now I don't claim to be an expert in such things, but before we dive in we should probably look to understand a key part of the film which is found in Japanese folklore. In Japanese myths and legends, there are various creatures known as yokai. Yokai are spirits or demons, helpful or harmful, that come in many different shapes and forms, and are usually able to shapeshift. Many yokai are believed to walk amongst us on our earthly plane. They can be anything from living to inanimate. In fact, many animals are considered to carry the supernatural characteristics of yokai, for example, raccoons foxes, and in relevance to this film, cats. Now, cats are associated with yokai for not only their appearance, but also their mischievous, curious, and sporadic behavior. So now that we have a general idea about yokai and cats, let's dive into the plot of Kuroneko. Just a fair warning, there will be some spoilers ahead. I will not reveal everything, yet in order to properly discuss the film I will need to explain some important moments. The plot revolves around a mother and her daughter-in-law, who in the beginning of the film get brutally raped and murdered by a band of lawless samurai, who then burn down the home containing the two. The spirits of these two women then go on to haunt the Rajoman Gate in Kyoto, late at night luring traveling samurai with them back to their ghostly residence where they then entertain and seduce the samurai before killing them by biting out their throat and discarding their bodies out in the woods or in the rubble of their burnt out house. It's during the first encounter we are shown. While the women are entertaining the samurai, the mother brings up her son, who is also the husband of the younger of the two women. We learn her son was forcefully conscripted and sent off to fight in the north three years prior, and had yet to return. The samurai states that if the son is not dead yet, he has probably been made a samurai himself, and is most likely living the lavish and rich lifestyle all samurai do. Moving on, as more and more bodies get discovered, word begins to spread of the killings, and the potential spiritual forces behind such murders. Eventually, even the emperor comes to learn of what is happening and calls Minamoto no Raiko to him. Minamoto no Raiko is not the shogun, yet the film describes him as being the leader of the samurai. Thus, the emperor tasks him with discovering the true nature of the killings and putting an end to it. Raiko wishes to send one of his finest warriors, yet each that he calls upon is currently busy with other matters. It is then we cut to the northern island of Ezo, where a great battle had just occurred between the samurai and an army of the Amishi, the shamanistic Siberian people who inhabited the northern portions of Japan's islands. Almost all the forces on both sides were completely wiped out, except for a Japanese foot soldier and an Amishi general. The two fight, and surprisingly the foot soldier wins, taking the foe's head and returning with haste back to Kyoto, where he then presents the head to Raiko who then promptly makes the foot soldier a samurai, giving him the name and title, Gintoki of the Grove. Raiko, seeing an opportunity, then tasks Gintoki with discovering the true nature of the ghostly threat and putting an end to their samurai killing spree. However, as Gintoki moves to confront the spirits, it is discovered that he, in fact, is the son and husband who had been sent off to war three years prior only to now return to find his mother and wife are the very ghosts he was sent to destroy. And although the mother and wife refuse to reveal their identity to him, 
it is obvious both sides recognize each other. It is eventually revealed that the mother and wife had made an unholy deal that as long as they drink the blood of samurai, their spirits are allowed to stay on the mortal plane and not fall into the depths of hell. This is in revenge for their rape and murder at the hands of samurai. Tragically, the wife decides to give up her soul, giving up the drinking of blood so that she may have seven nights with her husband before she is ripped away and cast into hell. Not wishing to kill the spirit he believes to be his mother, Gintoki returns to Raiko, doing his best to explain the situation and begging him to send someone else to finish the job instead. This is where the film takes a slight turn from its usual trajectory and takes us down another interesting path. Upon learning that these spirits hate samurai, Raiko cannot believe it. In his eyes, samurai are stoic and heroic guardians that are completely devoid of corruption and evil intent. Yet, as we've already seen throughout the film and even just from Raiko's previous actions, this is sadly not the truth. This is where Kuroniko becomes not only a horror film, but also an anti-samurai film. It is a unique aspect for a film to adopt this stance, as we can see films that glorify samurai and their way of life and adherence to honor, such as Seven Samurai. There are also films that tear apart those very same ideals of the samurai, claiming them to be false and the true nature of samurai to be corrupt. And the most prime example of an anti-samurai film is my favorite samurai film of all, Harakiri from 1962, which I also mentioned in my last review. Now there is more to the story of Kuroneko, but I don't feel like I should spoil any more at this point, as I'm already sure you're probably wondering, what does any of this have to do with black cats? Well, as it turns out, there was a black cat that lived with the mother and wife, and as the smoke rose from the ashes of their house, we see this cat approach their bodies. Couple this, along with the flashes of black cats we get throughout their killings, and later, the cat-like appearance that one of the two spirits take. It begins to beg a question. Are the spirits of the mother and wife actually just black cats, taking their form and assuming their identity? The film does a good job never answering if the mother and wife are really who they appear to be. This opens the film up to endless speculation, as there really is no right or wrong answer, and by the end, nothing is revealed to us. However, the ending is also one of my biggest complaints, as it gives no closure. And while in some films that works just fine, and even though I'm all for leaving questions unanswered and abundant speculation, I still want the story to at least come to an end, which unfortunately, in the case of Kuroneko, it does not. As really, things come off feeling a little cheap, like the director didn't actually know how to bring the story to a close. But moving on, as far as the cast goes, everyone does a fine job. There are no big famous actors or actresses in this film, yet the roles are still filled pretty well regardless, with the only real standout performance coming from Kichimon Nakamura, who plays Gintoki. The film does shine in regards to its editing and cinematography. This is especially evident in scenes involving the ghostly manor, where the spirits dwell often fusing the shot together with scenes of the forest surrounding them, which goes to raise another question about does this place even exist or is it all just in the victim's mind? In terms of music, the score does suit the film well, yet it doesn't do anything too unique or inventive to earn any praise. Now to the final interesting portion of my review, the part where we discuss historical accuracy to the period. To be honest, I had a hard time placing when this film was supposed to have taken place, as the country is continually described as being in a state of constant war. Right away, you might suspect the Sengoku Jidai, Japan's warring states period, from 1467 to 1600. Yet, just from clothing, you can tell right away that this film takes place much earlier. Which is then made evident to us with the mention of the Fujiwara family and later when we are shown the Emperor having supreme authority. In actuality, the film is set sometime during the late 900s or perhaps even the early 1000s, and the only way I really knew this was from the character of Minamoto no Raiko, 
who in fact was a military leader in Kyoto. Now, most of what we see is a fair depiction of that time frame, as the film never shows anything so odd to snap us out of a sense of realism for the period. However, it is what is said that I take some issue with. As I've already mentioned, the film describes the time period as one of constant war, which is untrue during Raiko's lifespan. Had the film been set during the early 900s or mid 1000s, you could make an argument for the country being at war, as there were large rebellions occurring during those times. Yet, the point in which the film takes place was relatively unmarred by mass warfare. However, what we are shown still is entirely plausible, as the fighting we see taking place in Eizo, later to be known as Hokkaido, really could have occurred, as we know that the Amishi people who had been pushed out of Honshu, did take refuge in Eizo. The only real conflicts that occurred on the main islands during Raiko's lifespan were minor revolts and the rise of some gang banditry. Nothing to warrant the country at war statements. So, in conclusion, my final rating on Kuruneko is 2.5 stars out of 4. The film's strengths lie with how it's edited together, giving a masterful appearance. Yet, with little standout performances, mediocre historical accuracy, and with a good plot that unfortunately doesn't come to a good ending, I can't help but feel this film's potential was stunted. Although, Kuruneko is still worth watching in my opinion, especially around Halloween, or just if you're in the mood for something a little more spooky, as it is still very entertaining regardless of its flaws. So, have you seen Kuruneko? If you have, what did you think about it? Leave a comment below. And as always, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most entertaining.